old as we feel, I feel about 20. So let's go. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> and you're recognized for as long as you want to be recognized. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Spear, uh, welcome to the committee. Um, I have concerns that creating a national low carbon fuel standard will only galvanize efforts to enact another anti-consumer regulatory scheme such as phasing out liquid fuels through electrification mandates or banning heavy-duty diesel engines. Do you share this concern? And are there examples of such efforts in the states that have already enacted their own low-carbon fuel standards? There are. Thank you, Senator. Uh, as I mentioned uh, previously, we, we had litigated uh, in California and Oregon uh, largely because of the impact that it would have on our industry, particularly you know medium-sized companies with 20 trucks or fewer, down to owner operators, and those are folks that that pay at the you know, retail at the pump. They don't have fuel contracts, so uh, the impact that this has on inflating uh, the cost of diesel uh, in those states and in those areas is is quite measurable. Uh, it's the second uh, uh, largest cost drain under labor. And so uh, this is a make or break issue in terms of keeping them uh, out on the road moving freight. Those costs generally will be reflected uh, in what consumers pay, your constituents. So it needs to be a gradual process that takes into account the fact that we are already facing 40-year highs in inflation. So this is just an additive on top and reflected in the fuel prices, $7 exceeding in California, uh, nearly six fifty dollars in Oregon. Those are the highest in the country. So... Uh, we definitely are going to defend our membership when that happens. Well, President Biden recently noted in his State of the Union address that uh, the U.S. would continue to need liquid fuels for at least the next 10 years. Um, is, uh, is that uh, a statement that you agree with? I think it's going to be a little longer than 10, Senator. I really do. I, I believe we'll get there. Uh, as I said in my opening remarks, I, I, I firmly believe that, that we will transition in time, but it has to be inclusive. The timeline has to be realistic, and the targets have to be achievable for that to happen. I think this mad rush to zero is going to be very impactful, not just in state economies, but the national economy. So something we're very mindful. I think if we uh, pace ourselves uh, and let the market work its will, we will get to zero. Well, I know people in Wyoming are concerned because electronic vehicles are tested at sea level, which Wyoming is not, uh, tested on flat ground, which Wyoming is not, uh, tested at, you know, 60 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit, which Wyoming rarely is. In fact, today it's zero degrees again uh, in, uh, in, in Casper, Wyoming. So uh, those uh, factors... Uh, change uh, the distance one can travel on a charge dramatically, uh, and I don't think that that is well understood. So hopefully we can bring some of those factors to light uh, in the coming months. Uh, uh, Mr. Cooper, thank you for being here as well. Uh, as you know, the EPA issued what's called their set rule, uh, which among other things set RVO limits for the next three years and proposed to create a pathway for electric vehicles participation in the RFS. Mm -hmm. um, I'm concerned with how the EPA is proposing that auto OEMs generate ERINs. Um, what's your level of concern with the ERINs proposal from EPA? Well, thank you for the question, Senator, and, and we share your concern with the way that uh, EPA is proposing to allow electricity into the RFS program. We're not opposed to the inclusion of electricity in the RFS, uh, but it's got to be done right. And, and we share your concern that in the case of these ERINs, the generator of those credits would be the automaker, uh, like Tesla, and that's completely different, completely inconsistent with how REN credit generation is done across any other fuel that is regulated under the RFS. And, and so that, that gives us some concern. Uh, we're also concerned with the way that EPA would allow uh, those automakers to benefit from what's called book and claim accounting, uh, which is essentially, you know, the automaker is going to uh, sign a contract with a renewable electricity producer, could be thousands of miles away, and when that electron enters the grid, the automaker gets to claim that carbon reduction 
benefit from that electron, you know, whether it ever is used to fuel an electric vehicle or not. And so we have some concerns with inconsistent application of, of that accounting practice. Now, I may have to spend a little more time with you, Mr. Cooper, to better understand that, but I appreciate you happy to. making me aware of that. Uh, do you believe EPA's proposal aligns with congressional intent when it created the RFS nearly two decades ago? Uh, that is another concern we have as, as we look at the statutory intent of the RFS program and, and our understanding of that intent. It was all about stimulating the production and use of renewable fuels, uh, not necessarily about stimulating the production and use of certain vehicle technologies. We think if, if you all in Congress had intended the program to drive certain vehicle technologies, you, know, you, you would have been more explicit about that. And is it appropriate? for EPA to combine their ERINs rulemaking with the uh, 2023 through 2025 RVOs? We have asked in, in the comments we just submitted to EPA last week that they uh, sever that portion of the proposal or, or, or that portion of the rulemaking from the, the actual volume requirements. Uh, we think EPA should move ahead with finalizing those volume requirements uh, but it sounds like they need more time to really figure out this ERIN uh, proposal and, and to make sure they're getting it right. So we, we would prefer to see EPA separate those two uh, parts of the proposal from one another. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank all of our witnesses for being here today. Thank you for helping educate and inform the committee. I yield back. You bet. And I want to thank you for being here and to uh, join us in, in uh, a good learning exercise. When I was privileged to be uh, governor of our state, I was very active in the national